tonight on KQED Newsroom. As San Francisco District Attorney Chase Abedin faces a divisive recall on June 7th, he sits down with us to talk about public safety and what he says this recall is all about. And a special KQED investigation examines how a plot to blow up California's Democratic headquarters reveals extremists hiding in plain sight. Plus, we take a walk along San Jose's Guadalupe River Trail and its miles of murals in this week's Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, May 20th, 2022. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. On June 7th, San Francisco voters will determine whether the city's top prosecutor will keep his job or be recalled. Those who want to remove District Attorney Chase Boudin from office say his policies are too soft on crime and that San Francisco has become unsafe. But many who support Boudin say that he is being blamed unfairly for car break-ins, thefts and overdoses, and that a recall won't solve the city's problems. Chase Boudin joins me now. Welcome, Mr. District Attorney. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Priya. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's talk about what's going on in San Francisco, because there definitely is this feeling by many that it is unsafe, that crime is rampant, and that these problems need to be fixed. You are one piece of that puzzle. You're not the whole thing. If you had a magic wand, what would you say it would take? What's the time, the money, the collaboration? What's the investment that needs to happen to help people feel safe in San Francisco? There's nothing more important to me in my entire office than making San Francisco safe and making sure everybody who lives here feels safe in their home, in their neighborhood, and everywhere in our amazing city. And you're right, we have challenges when it comes to public safety. They're not new. Some of them got worse during the pandemic. Some of them improved. The reality is we're dealing with the same kinds of challenges that every big city in California and across America is dealing with. But the recall is spending millions of dollars, largely from out-of-town Republicans, to try and promote fear, to undermine a sense of safety and security in our community. And we're going to get to all of that. But what would you do? What would it take to fix what people are feeling right now? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that people understand what the data shows. Overall, crime is actually down in the last two years, 28,000 fewer reported crimes during the two and a half years of my administration when compared with the two and a half years prior to my time in office. But there's a lot of focus on crime. I think that's a good thing. We need to solve crime. Every time a crime is committed, somebody's harmed. There's a victim, somebody's suffering. That's why I've made it a priority to expand victim services and to lead law enforcement operations that are collaborative between my agency and other partner law enforcement agencies that get at the root causes of crime and that take apart the big fish, like our auto burglary abatement operation a couple weeks ago that arrested a major fence who was moving millions of dollars of stolen electronics from parked cars in San Francisco to places as far away as Eastern Europe, and Vietnam. What about the other agencies in the city? You're talking about what you are doing. Happy to put this all on you. It's all at your doorstep, Mr. DA. You are responsible for all the crime in the city. Is that uh, accurate? And certainly that's how the recall <laughs> folks would, would like to simplify the conversation. You know, what's so dangerous about that approach is it suggests that simply changing the district attorney could, like a magic bullet, make all crime and public safety problems disappear. We know that's not true. We know it's not true because San Francisco has always had high rates of property crime since way before I was in office. We know it's not true because there's no jurisdiction in this country, no matter how tough on crime you get. Go to Sacramento with a formerly Republican district attorney now running for attorney general against the Democrat incumbent, where crime rates, violent and property, have skyrocketed far worse than San Francisco over the last couple of years. It's simply not true. And for me to do my job well, for me to hold people accountable when they commit crimes, the first step in every single case is that people have to call the police and report crime. And the second step is that police have to investigate and bring my office solid investigations. And you have said that, that those numbers are low, that police are not closing, clearing cases and bringing you people to actually charge. You don't need to take my word for it. The police department has a really transparent, easy to use data dashboard where they show crime rates as reported to police and clearance rates, the rate at which police make arrests. Uh, during the time I've been in office, there have been double digit declines in the rate at which police solve every category of crime as compared to 2019. Now there's real challenges that police are facing. 
people are wearing face masks an awful lot these days. It means even video footage can sometimes be inadequate to uh, solve crimes. We also know that the police department says they're really understaffed and they're asking for more resources. So I'm not sure what the problem is. What I know is that for me to prosecute crimes, to hold people accountable, whether you're someone who believes in the toughest on crime solutions or whether you believe in diversion and restorative justice, no matter where you come down on that spectrum, the first step is police have to make an arrest and bring me an investigation. The counter argument here that I've heard several times is police say, well, the DA is not going to charge him. What's the point of arresting? Well, there's two problems with that argument. The first one is that it's a lie. And we know it's a lie because I'm actually charging crimes overall at higher rates than my predecessor and at higher rates than other district attorneys around the Bay Area. So it's simply and demonstrably dishonest to say that. But let's assume for a minute that it were true. What would happen in our government, in our system, if Every agency that disagreed with the way another agency was doing its job simply said, I give up, I'm not going to do mine. Imagine for a moment if every time a judge released somebody from custody that I believe should be held, detained in jail pending trial, I said, well, if the judges are going to do things that way, I'm just not going to bother filing charges at all. The whole system would break down. We need police to do their job, whether they agree or disagree with the laws passed in Sacramento, whether they agree or disagree with the people San Francisco voters elect to serve. We all have to do our jobs, and we have to depend on each other to do our jobs. I count on the police to respond to crimes, to investigate honestly, to serve courageously, and to make arrests so that I can prosecute people who've caused harm in our communities. You've shared your thoughts with us here on KQED Newsroom before, and uh, one of the earliest times when you, was when you were DA-elect. You hadn't even taken office yet. Back in 2019, you sat down with one of my colleagues, Marisa Lagos, and you talked about your plans for what was to come. And you spoke at that time about what you were planning to do in terms of your relationship with the police. So let's listen to that and uh, come back and talk a little bit about it now. And are you concerned that police could attempt to undermine really what you want to do? You know, I hope that we'll be able to work together. And I think it starts with me communicating to the police that I have their back and that I want to do what I can to ensure their hard work uh, is, is followed through on by the district attorney's office. That is not how many would describe the police's feeling now. That relationship, despite your relationship with the police chief as being workable, as you've, you've said, the relationship with the police department overall seems to be hostile. So what happened to the plan? Well, I've uh, done what I can to extend olive branches. I reached out to the president of the police union, sat down for coffee, asked what I could do to help him and his team. Um, it seems like the police union is really intent on attacking whoever holds this office. Um, you know, if it were just me, then you could say, well, maybe it's something about Chesa Boudin. But the police union in San Francisco has attacked and undermined every single district attorney going back for decades. Terrence Hallinan, Kamala Harris, even D.A. Gascon, who had been chief of police immediately prior to being appointed. In other words, when you see that kind of a pattern over time, over decades, you start to wonder why is it so hard for the police union leadership to work with the district attorney's office. I have an open door policy. I'm eager, ready, and willing to work with anybody who shares my commitment to making San Francisco safer for everyone. So you've had some tough times in office in these first couple of years, not the least of which is because of the pandemic and the changes that your office had to make to continue to operate even within that framework, which we all have had to handle. Um, but you have followed through on some of your campaign promises. You ended cash bail, which has been controversial, but you've ended cash bail. There is, are fewer people incarcerated than there were before the pandemic, before you took office. You have also spoken with pride about your work in terms of supporting victims of crime. Should you stay in office, what more do you want to accomplish? Well, my number one priority since taking office has been to expand resources for crime victims. And I'm tremendously proud of what has been a historic expansion of the number of victim advocates in our office, of the language access. We've increased the number of Chinese-speaking victim advocates by about 500 percent since I took office. And for the first time in San Francisco history, we have victim advocates dedicated to supporting property crime victims. It's amazing to think that in a city that led the country in property crime in the years before I took office, we didn't have a single property crime victim advocate. Now we've got two positions focusing on those areas. So I want to continue to expand our resources for domestic violence survivors, for sexual assault survivors. 
And I want to make sure that my office is leading the way, not just on responding after crimes occur, but on preventing crimes from occurring. In other words, work like, to give one example, our lawsuit against ghost gun manufacturers, companies that are making guns designed to be used in crimes, to be untraceable, to be sold, to even people with criminal records. We don't want to wait until the next gun crime or homicide occurs. We want to get ahead of that problem by preventing those guns from hitting our streets in the first place. Mr. Boudin, you are married, you have a young child who's eight months old. Um, you know, you, you live here. You share many of the same concerns that other residents do. How do you feel when you go walking around in the Tenderloin or in other parts of San Francisco? And do you see that shift? Do you feel that shift in terms of safety over the last couple of years? I am tremendously proud of the city I live in. I married my wife in Golden Gate Park. My son was born right here in San Francisco at UCSF, where my wife works. And I'm excited to be able to raise my son in a city that's not only one of the safest cities in the country, if you look at the data, but also it's a city that's leading the way around so many issues of our time, marriage equality, marijuana decriminalization, and yes, criminal justice reform. I do feel safe, and that doesn't mean we don't have work to do. Of course we do. Every big city in America has work to do. Sacramento, Oakland, cities near and far have far worse problems when it comes to violent crime than San Francisco does. And of course, I want neighborhoods, especially like the Tenderloin and Mission and Soma, that we know for decades have been dumping grounds for our public health crisis, addiction, mental illness. We need those neighborhoods to be revitalized, rejuvenated, but it's not gonna happen overnight. I took office in the very beginning of 2020, and within a couple of months, I was locked out of my office by the COVID pandemic. The changes that we've experienced in the last couple of years are driven primarily by a global pandemic. It's something we've all experienced, the, the way we work, the way we socialize, the way we live our lives. And the recall is unfairly and dishonestly suggesting that changes that are a result of the pandemic are because of policies in my office or because of broader criminal justice reform. It's just not true. You are a fighter. You have had to fight to win an election before. This is not new to you. Do you find yourself feeling like a sense of exhilaration at this point? Or do you feel like some frustration creeping in? Do you have a power ballad that keeps you going? <laughs> How are you managing these you last know, ar around, few days? To around, this call? Yeah, we've got 18 days to go as we sit here. Around our house, we listen to and sing the wheels on the bus an awful <laughs> lot. Uh, it's my eight month old son's favorite. And it's uh, one of the only songs I can uh, actually carry a tune for. So. Uh, that's our power ballot at the moment. But but yes, um, I'm a fighter. I never give up, and I'm never going to give up on doing what's right for San Francisco. Mr. District Attorney Chase Boudin, thank you for your time. Thank you. Now we're turning to a special KQED investigation into extremism in California. Last year, when authorities charged more than 700 people involved in the January 6th attack on the nation's capital, 40 of them were from California. Many of them are alleged to hold anti-government or other extremist ideologies. From what our reporters found, those are not isolated cases. Here in Northern California, two men are in federal custody on charges of conspiracy to blow up California's Democratic headquarters. What fueled their plot? Who were they? And how widespread is this problem? Well, Julie Small covers criminal justice and Alex Hall covers the Central Valley. And they're the KQED reporters who dove into this story. They join me now here. Thanks for being here. I am fascinated by your investigating on this story, your work and your reporting. So, you know, kick us off. Julie, how did this all get started? Tell us about who these people were and how you found out about them. Well, one of the really interesting things about this story is that it started in Napa. Mm. Uh, the city of Napa in California's wine country. Uh, Ian Rogers, uh, he owned the British Auto Repair Shop. It had been his business for 16 years. He was a upstanding member of the community. Um, he, uh, he had a mechanic named Jared Copeland, who they became friends, and even if, after Jared left his employ, he, they would work out together. Mm -hmm. They uh, liked shooting guns together. They uh, also both supported Trump, and they became very upset when Trump lost the election in 2020. But they weren't part of the group that went to uh, Washington, D.C. and actually participated in the insurrection. So what, what did they do? What happened? So around the time that um, Joe Biden was declared 
uh, winner of the 2020 presidential election, um, Rogers and Copeland started sending each other messages, um, encrypted messages about you know their outrage at the outcome of the election, um, just their outrage in general at Democrats and, and at the left. Um, and they decided to do something about it. They decided to take action. Um, at first they decided that they were going to plan an attack on the governor's mansion in Sacramento, but they quickly pivoted to um, making a plan around um, either uh, burning down or um, cr creating some other kind of violent attack around the California Democratic Party headquarters in Sacramento. And then over the course of about six to eight weeks, they went about um, discussing how exactly they would do that. And one of the fascinating parts here of this investigation is that you actually have the text messages that they sent to each other as part of these court records that were unsealed. We have pulled a couple of those sections and would love for you two to share with us what some of those thoughts were. Um, Julie, you focused in your reporting on Rogers. Alex, you on Copeland. If you wouldn't mind reading each of their mm -hmm. words here. Sure. Uh, so Rogers uh, texted Copeland, scare the whole country. Can you imagine CNN covering this? Ha ha. I'll leave an envelope with our demands and intentions, basically saying we declare war on the Democratic Party and all traitors to the Republic. Copeland replied, that's some expendable stuff. Rogers says, we need to send a message. Yep, I agree. Start a movement. And then in another text message exchange, it sounded like they really were seriously uh, willing to sacrifice for this uh, plot that they were putting together. That's right, Rogers, he texted Copeland and he asked him if he was ready to leave his wife. He said, what I'm talking about, we probably will die, unfortunately. Koblenz references his wife and says, she was crying yesterday and said to me, please don't leave me. I don't know what I would do without you. She was rubbing my back while I was watching. She knows how I run and she knows I will put myself in harm's way for what I believe in. So these are just words here. They're text messages. They're, they're not action. Um, and these men did not actually bomb the Democratic Party headquarters, um, they were talking about it. And their friends and family who are defending them say, oh, they were just drunk, and these are just messages they were sending to each other being macho. Right. They, they didn't really mean any of this. Tell me about your work on the ground, actually talking with the friends and family, and what your perception is. Well, um, one of the first people I talked to was um, Ian Rogers' wife. Uh, she lives in Napa, and I, I knocked on her door, and she was willing to talk to me. and. You know, she said, if I read all the things that people wrote about my husband, I too would be scared of this man, but I'm not because I know who he is. He was never going to do it. Um, yeah, he had a lot of guns, but that was his hobby. He's been collecting them for 20 years. And you know, this was just like um, some drunken text he sent to his friend. Hmm. Alex. Yeah, um, it was challenging to find people who not only know Rogers and Copeland, but would be willing to talk to us. Obviously, it's a very politically sensitive case and story. Um, I was able to find um, Jared Copeland's cousin, Novice Dublin, in Mayfield, Kentucky, where he's from. Um, Jared had actually liked uh, his landscaping business's Facebook page, and so I hmm. called him up, and he actually was really um, forthcoming and said that, Jared's whole family was completely shocked at the charges, that it just didn't sound like him, that growing up as a kid, Jared Copeland was not, you know, the kind of kid who was out, you know, roughhousing, fishing, hunting, you know. Um, he, he, that, it just wasn't um, his personality. And so everyone was really surprised, and he even said, you know, I don't think he's even had a speeding ticket before. Now, these two men were part of a militia organization here in California, however, belying the words of these others, their, their friends and family. Uh, Julie, would you tell us a little bit about that organization? Yeah, they joined something called Three Up, mm -hmm. uh, Three United Patriots, the California offshoot of the Three Percenter movement. And Three Percenters believe that uh, during the American Revolution, it was 3% of the, uh, the, the population that actually defeated the British. That's been proven to be false. That's not a true claim. But mm -hmm. the point is that they see themselves as sort of the ones who are going to stand up for the country, defend the country mm -hmm. against invasion or maybe uh, against a stolen election, because mm -hmm. uh, many did believe that the election was stolen. Mm -hmm. So Alex, was any of this behavior illegal? It seems like there's at least enough cause for the FBI to think so, because they've been charged and they're arrested. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
the way that the FBI explained it to us is that, you know, you're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe. Membership in a group by itself is not grounds for investigation by the FBI. Um, because the First Amendment protects your right, anyone's right, to basically express outrage, dissatisfaction with elected officials, political parties, etc. Um, so the way that federal investigators and prosecutors go about investigating domestic terrorism is they basically have to um, identify an individual who is on, on the pathway towards planning an attack mm -hmm. and violates federal law on that pathway. And so um, the charges against Rogers and Copeland are not that they were a member of a group, um, it's what they did um, that violated federal law while they were making those plans. There was a term I heard you use earlier as we were preparing for this segment, left of boom, right. which I think is a really interesting phrase, that you wanna catch people before that action happens. Right, and that's how the FBI explained it to us, is that you know, um, in the absence of a domestic terrorism statute, basically you've got on a timeline from an individual who's planning to launch an attack, moving from left to right, with right at the end being this attack that eventually they're planning to carry out, they want to um, intercept and prevent that individual from actually moving all the way to boom on the right hand side. And that is what may have happened here. Tell us, Julie, how the FBI ended up actually deciding to make this arrest. Well, I, I don't know the full story of how they made the decision to make the arrest, but I do know that they were tipped off uh, by somebody who knew Ian Rogers and had become very concerned about his behavior. He sent the FBI an envelope full of evidence, screenshots, and uh, a, a statement that said, this man is armed to the teeth, he's uh, enraged, he uh, is threatening to kill somebody, mm -hmm. and you should please arrest this maniac now. Uh, it took several months after that for them to actually make an arrest, but that was the beginning of it. And what did the authorities find? Well, uh, in, in Roger's case, uh, they, they went to his business and they found a safe actually in the auto repair shop. It had five uh, pipe bombs, it had guns in it, it had machine guns. Um, also, several books about how to make homemade explosives, wow. um, Nazi paraphernalia, a Nazi flag. Then they went to his house, they found more guns, they looked in his RV, they found more guns. By the end of the day, they had found 50 guns, mm. uh, many of which uh, were illegal to own in California, such as machine guns, and also guns that had been illegally modified to become machine guns. This is not just a problem in terms of the concept of domestic terrorism. It is on the rise across the nation um, and here in California. And this is something you spoke with the special agent who was involved in this case from the San Francisco office about John Blair. And we want to play a soundbite from your interview with him, a little clip of that. Uh, there is absolutely an uptick. We are seeing an increase in both the level of violence and the number of individual actors uh, since the summer of 2020. What are we going to pay the closest attention to? Anti-government, anti-authority extremism is our, our highest ranked threat right now, very closely followed by uh, racially motivated violent extremists. Alex, what can you add to what we're hearing about this growth in um, these sorts of problems? Yeah, so we're coming off of just a little over a year um, since the January 6th um, Capitol insurrection. The FBI's caseload of investigations related to um, violent domestic extremists has more than doubled since um, the spring of 2020. Um, as Blair said, you know, they're seeing an uptick not only in the number of cases, but the number of individuals who are involved, um, perpetrators of this kind of um, suspected behavior, and also the level of violence. Um, and you know, another thing is that um, in, in January or around there, basically the Department of Justice um, said that they announced that they are going to create a special unit to prosecute um, cases just like this one. Because of this increase in, mm -hmm. in the number of crimes. Um, here in California also we have a number, 40, 45 groups that are anti-government as well. Yep. That's right. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there are 45 groups that are anti-government in California, and four of them are malicious. Okay. The two men who are in federal custody now, what is expected to happen next with them? Well, right now, Rogers is, um, he's facing 
charges in both federal and state court. So his attorney is trying to get a plea deal where he gets one sentence, not two. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's st still very much up in the air. He's negotiating. Okay. And Alex, this is the first investigation that the two of you are working on together, but it's not going to be the last. You're sort of a newly formed reporting task force here at KQED. Can you tell us about what your, your mission is there? Yeah, um, so Julie and I are kind of taking a step back and looking at the uptick in um, domestic violent extremists, um, not only in the United States, but specifically here in California. You know, what motivates them? Who influenced them and who do they influence? And when we started working on this story, we knew a little bit of the news of just like their arrests and the charges against them, but there wasn't a lot of information out about how they met, why, you know, how they came up with this plan and, and what the backstory was. And so that's what we're, we really want to dive into is, mm -hmm. is understanding um, more about just the players and um, the consequences of these kind of plots. All right. Alex Hall, Julie Small, thank you for your reporting on this, and we look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank, thank you. This week's Something Beautiful is a look at San Jose Walls, a public art corridor along the Guadalupe River Trail. This year, this outdoor studio features several new murals created at different spots by an array of local artists as diverse as San Jose itself. I love how there are so many different kinds of images there. It is supposed to be a beautiful weekend, so take yourself for a stroll and check it out. That's the end of our show for tonight. You can find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter, or email us at knr at kqed.org. You can reach me on social media at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you for joining us. We will see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.